This is a headgum podcast. Folks, it's time to get quip. Me and Joe do it. It makes toothbrushing easy. Brushing your teeth, just like making love. The kind of thing you don't really know if you're doing it right till you start doing it right. And folks, quip is brushing done right. It's the new electric toothbrush that packs just the right amount of vibrations into a slimmer design at a fraction of the cost of bulkier traditional electric brushes. It has guiding pulses that alert you when to switch sides, making brushing just the right amount of effortless. It's true. You really don't have to think about it. It lets you know when to move on to another quadrant of your mouth. Quip also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel anywhere, whether it's going in your gym bag or your carry-on. And because the thing that cleans your mouth should also be clean, Quip subscription plan or subscription plan, surprised they didn't think of that, I'll, I'll have to let them know, refreshes your brush on a dentist-recommended schedule. They deliver new brush heads every three months for just five bucks, including free shipping worldwide. Quip's backed by a network of over 10,000 dental professionals, including dentists, hygienists, and dental students. Most toothbrushes don't get named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year, but Quip did. It's time to find out for yourself why. Quip starts at just 25 bucks, and if you go to getquip.com slash see you right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash see you. G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash see you. Folks, it's going to be love at first brush. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to That There Will See You in Hell podcast. yee This is where you go to hear the talk about the horror movies and the scary thing. My name is Joe DeRosa. And I'm Pat Walsh. I'm done with the uh, country western bit. It was we got dressed up. up for this. Come on, you're not you're bailing I am on it already. A, a flannel shirt. <laughs> you were you were heading into sort of a Walter Brennan uh, territory. I don't know who Walter Brennan is. Like an, an old prospector from the old westerns. Uh, I got to admit, I lost faith in it almost immediately and <laughs> didn't want to really commit to it anymore. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, how are you, Joe? <laughs> Pat, I'm I'm well. Good. I'm well. I have a show this evening. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Glad to hear it. Uh, I'm going to go down there and do some of this shit I call comedy. Glad to hear it. I'm yeah. going to a picture with a friend, and I, because we get sent all the screeners of the Oscar movies, um, I realize just how bleak it is, like th- that January slate of releases that come out. So <laughs> we're like... He's a, you know, he's a writer too. We were like, well, what are we gonna see? Uh, start going through the list. Here are our options: Paddington Two, oh. which I do see raved about every day on Twitter. People for, seem to love Paddington Two for Christ's but sakes. I can't do it. Yeah, I did see Paddington One. Was it good? It was, uh, you know, visually cool. It was like a, a, a Wes Anderson movie for kids, except we already had a good one of those, Fantastic Mr. Fox. And uh, I don't, I don't get the huge appeal, but Paddington Two is supposed to be incredible, guys. Haven't seen it, of course. All uh, right, the, the Commuter with Liam Neeson. The title of that thing, barely passable. I mean, the, the man who who is, I guess, his counterpart now, Liam Neeson, the man who played Oscar Schindler. He is like our modern day. Who, who uh, Charles Bronson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's become like a Charles Bronson, where it's like he was an actor that did all types of stuff, and then suddenly it's Death Wish Seven. Yeah, you know? I mean, uh, I'm sure they they cut him five million for each of these things, and I'm happy. And I, I think he's exercising some demons about the death of his wife. He's always avenging the death of his wife. But uh, I do wish the guy would make something 
up to his talents once in a while. I, I, uh, I've raved about The Grey on here before, a great movie about fighting wolves. And he's, I loved him on extras. He has said he's not done with drama. He's just like, okay. yeah, I'm just doing this stuff. He, I am, I'm excited because he publicly said if they do make the Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, yeah. he wants to come back as Qui-Gon. Okay. And I would love to see him and e- Ewan McGregor in those roles again in a movie that was a little more focused on them and a little less focused on trade disputes. <laughs> Uh, I thought he was real boring in those movies and real boring in Batman Begins. I thought he was such a lame fucking villain. He's just like a guy when you have when you have the access to all those classic Batman villains. And it's like, hey, uh, Liam Neeson's playing a guy. Well, he's Ray Shal Ghul. Ray Shal Ghul wouldn't be a flamboyant villain. He's a mastermind. He's not. You know, well, it's, it was a shitty villain, in my opinion. <laughs> it's Batman's um, arch enemy. Anyway, Paddington 2, The Commuter, and Jumanji, which I have heard is funny, too, but I don't know, guys. Uh, it's Listen, you're going to go see The Commuter. I think we're seeing The Commuter. Because yeah. I won't talk to you if you see the other two. <laughs> uh, uh, look, yeah, I tried looking the other night for something to see, and it was the same thing. And I was like, if The Commuter's the best I can come up with, I don't give a shit if it is under my movie I pass. Know. I'm not going. I don't feel like it. I know, but Jumanji's got uh, Jack Black, who I always love, and the, the combo of Jack Black, Kevin Hart, and The Rock is certainly intriguing to me. I didn't like it the first time, though. Look, I like Kevin. I know him from comedy. Yeah. He's a friend. No, he's not a friend, but as a guy, I know, sort of. Like, if I see him, we say hello. Yeah. Always been nice to me. We started at the same club. Punched up a pilot of his once. Very nice. Very nice. Nothing bad to say about the guy. Jack Black seems nice enough. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure he's a delight. Yeah. Huge fan of The Rock from back in the day. Yeah. That being said. No interest. Zero interest. And yeah. why? Because these men don't make good movies apart from one another. That's true. Throwing them together is not going to make a good movie, especially when, in my opinion, it's Works a... for Three Amigos. Uh, well, no, Steve Martin was in the zone then. Yeah, he was. Chevy Chase was still, you know. He was. Th- th- All right. And especially when the movie is Cheerfully a sequel withdrawn. to a movie that they clearly wanted to make with Robin Williams. Yes. And couldn't. Yeah. So then they had to figure out this other way to do it. You think they would have done it again with Williams? Why wouldn't they have? I guess so. I guess I don't remember... What was he a dad or something in that? I don't even remember what, yeah, what the it was. It was like a was. game from when he. It was like every other fucking Robin oh, yeah. Williams movie. Like he was a boy and remembered oh, a thing, right. and then the thing was real and yeah. it came to life. I was always uh, jealous of the kids in Jumanji because when I was a kid, I got sucked into Boggle, <laughs> folks. <laughs> I was just spelling giant words with blocks for weeks at a time. Uh I um well and then what was Zathura? Zathura was also got they got sucked into a board game. Favreau did that one. Yeah, I saw so, it. I just don't remember. Know. Look, I guess Zathura. I got as far as Dak Shepard. I know. Well, I, I checked out of that. I, one. I am friendly with Dak Shepard. He's a very nice man. Is he nice? Uh, look, I, I never met the second the guy. time. The first time you took a crack at him like three weeks ago, I let it go. Now I have to tell you, he's my friend. So and, uh, and, and if he's he's a friend in the same way Kevin Hart is your friend. Listen, he's an acquaintance. I'm not saying he's a shit guy. I've yes. never met the guy. I'm just saying I've never seen one thing he was in that I wanted to watch. Sure. He's good friends with McElhenney and them. He's funny on Idiocracy, Dak Shepard. All right. Some people don't get the material they, they deserve. You know, I don't know what to tell you. But um, I, I, I think yeah, I think uh, somebody could have done a lot more with that Chips film. If that I watched fell, Chips. If that fell in the right hands. You didn't see Chips. <laughs> Did you see Chips? Tell me it was good. Tell I talked about it on this show. I said it had a few big laughs. A few big laughs. Yeah. What doesn't anymore? The State of the Union had a few big <laughs> laughs. Oh, <it's> politics. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll Speaking of off. Trump, uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine in New York and I used to love The Apprentice. Uh-huh. And uh, like early, early Apprentice. And it's one of the hardest I've ever laughed. I, we were both drinking a, like a bottle of wine. And Trump was on there, and he, he was so awkward. He used to do this all the time. He would clearly have taken a million-dollar check to promote something. Right. But he's such a clumsy oaf that when he would try to be a businessman and promote shit, it was so pathetically done. Right. And he just couldn't just gradually, like, you know, slip things into conversation. Like, like you know, we sponsor Quip. 
Right. The toothbrush company. Now I'm yeah. giving them free advertising. They yeah, sponsor us. They sponsor us. They yeah. sponsor us. If they were to uh, say, you know, hey, this week, could you talk about Quip on the show? We'd find a way to do it, you know? And and, and nobody would know we were doing an ad because we're smart people. Here's well, how- unless they were like, why are they suddenly talking in the middle of the show? Yeah, that's, about- true, that's true. Sure, yeah. But I but hear you. Trump was trying to promote Zathura. <laughs> Zathura <laughs> and my God, it was funny because he did it like 10 different times. And he would go, uh, you know, this this reminds me of something uh, – Something I saw in the uh, co- the new Columbia TriStar Pictures of Thur. <laughs> and have you seen this thing? I mean, the the kids go into a board game. It, it's it's a it's a new Columbia TriStar Pictures. Zathur. He every time he would say Columbia TriStar Picture. Oh my god! Uh, it just cracked me up. That's I a tough. I, I, look, I'll I'll give him this much of a break. That's a tough <laughs> plug to slip. It's into hard, it's hard on a show about uh, being a businessman. <laughs> To slip in Zathura, I grant you, yes, but uh, I, I'm not. I'm never going to cut that man any slack at this point. Well, you know what I mean. I just, yes. um, you know, uh, the, uh, I'm just. I don't know. How would you do it? The Zathura plug. Well, this show would be incredibly easy. We just randomly started talking about Zathura a second ago, but uh, all right, that's a good point. I told you. I'm. I. I. I know. I've told you this, but did I ever tell you about when I got interviewed to write promos for the Martha Stewart show? No. Oh, okay. Here's a funny little story. So I was an NBC page, as you know, for a year in New York at 30 Rock. And you're supposed to get a job during that year. It's like your goal. And I didn't. There was a hiring freeze at NBC while I was a page, right. which really is just my luck in a nutshell. And I didn't get a job. And, I, you know, I had worked on Conan and SNL and I had done very well and I gave great tours and I was well liked. And How I was, does the page job pay, by the way? Ten dollars an hour living in New York City, and you were capped at 40 hours a week. All right. Well, I mean, but that's doable. The, the, the year that you were there, the time the period you were there, if you were out in Brooklyn, that's that's doable. I lived in Astoria, yeah. You know, it was 1600 bucks a month. Ooh, actually, no. What am I talking about? That's that's rough. Yeah, no, I uh, and I went there with $700 in savings. <laughs> I mean, I, I never had any money, and I accumulated a ton of credit card debt, which I brought out to Los Angeles with me. Every dollar I made on Always Sunny went towards my credit card debt. Okay. For both years I was there. Part of that's because that show paid nothing. Total? But uh, what's up? How much did you rack up total? Uh, when I made it to L.A., I was at twenty grand, I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It, it was. It's. It sucks. And then of course the interest piles on. It does pile on, doesn't it? Uh, now I I'm, I'm scot free, but uh, knock on wood, folks. Anyway. Uh, so I'm a page. I didn't get the job. And then I started really panicking because once it ended, I'm like, now I have no income and credit right. card debt and everything else. And I wasn't sleeping and I was distraught. So I'm like, I'll take anything. And Martha Stewart had the daytime talk show. And at the time she was also doing her apprentice, like the weird Martha Stewart apprentice. This is like when she just got out of prison, exactly. right? Yeah. So, and she had her daytime talk show. So we went down and I met for the promo department. And so I met with them and they were like, okay, it went great. Um, they were like, so your assignment then to see how you do, cause we got to test you creatively is uh-huh. go home tonight. Um, and, but you know, tomorrow, this time noon, send us a promo for the Martha Stewart show. <laughs> and I was like, okay, just a promo for anything. And she goes, yeah. Um, she goes, well, actually let's say Donald Trump's going to be on the show tomorrow. So what would you do for that? And I said, what if I told you I didn't need to go home and I can do a promo for you right now? And she goes, uh, okay, what would it be? And I said, uh, Trump may rule the boardroom, but nobody trumps Martha in the kitchen. Right. She puts her hand out and goes, welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a real thrill Woo. for me. And then it turned out, and this, look, I'm not telling tales outside of school here. They were offering me a salary of like $19,000 a year. To write for this show. And I was like, this is New York City. Like, that's, I was making more as a, a glorified intern. <laughs> and I eventually had to turn it down. But anyway, it all worked out. I got a job at NBC Marketing. I used to do, I used to do PowerPoints that would bring a tear to your eye. I, I the Office with Steve Carell in ages 18 to 49. It gets great in the demo. I did all that shit for a long time. You've got a great way with the words. I'm a wordsmith, Joe. Yeah. Your personality... Whatever it leaves it's to be desired, it's not great. You make up for it with your words. That's right. On paper. That's right. Uh, 
I'm the exact opposite, meaning that I'm not desirable in either place. No. And physically is not great either. I think physically I've got, I refer to it as a hard body. <laughs> not a beach body, but a hard body. Not a beach body, but a hard, yes. Uh, uh, let me take we, you to the movie corner. Did you get on with the, you know, I didn't. And so, you didn't. You almost fucking missed it again. Well, you know, we're not, I can always go back, circle back to it. It sucks it, because. You, you, what, ne- you never put it after movie corner. No, what, I This don't. is madness. But. It'd be like Weekend Update coming before the first musical performance. Yeah, or whatever. it's crazy. Um, no, I'll do it. it it's uh, I hadn't thought of one. As always, I have not planned one, so I'm just going to start talking and see if it comes do out. Do the Howard Jones one. I already did it. No, you didn't do the Howard Jones one. Joe, I did it. It was a huge success. Everybody loved you it. You did the Joe, 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 Joe. Joe no, Joe. I just told you to do I sang it to you and said my friend used to sing it to me. You never did it, though. Oh, well, I can't do it if you did it on the show. All right. All right. I I got one. I'm ready. All right. Anyway, let's just try to make this seem natural. Let's get on with the the, the show. Uh Woo. Let's get on with the show. And at the same time, on with the Joe Water Night. (laughs) Late December back in 63. (laughs) Right? That was good. I wish you guys could see the way he dances and like shimmies around. You know, uh, Frankie Valley of the Four Seasons plays a mobster on Sopranos in a couple episodes, and he's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I remember. Oh wait, no, that's a lie. I was going to say I remember him being a good actor, but that was Frankie Avalon. Oh, from Back to the Beach. Yeah, well, he, you know, he's a good actor. He was a good kid. He did it. Remember? Oh, you no, know, yeah. Back to the Beach was the one where where they go back in their like sixties, right? And it's right. him and Annette Funicello. and Chewie Herman's in it. Yeah, what's the premise of that? They got to save the beach or something? It's the yeah, save the beach. Isn't it? <laughs> Back to the beach had a little. It was it was smart. It was kind of funny. And Pee Wee's in it. That's why I watched. That's why I watched it too as a kid. Um, um, speaking of Pee Wee, let's go to the movie corner and jerk off in the theater. That I was talking about this. Was that with you? I think it was with you the other night. They ran Pee Wee Herman out of this fucking town, Paul Rubens, for masturbating his own penis. In a porno theater. Yeah. And look at what's going on now. It pisses me the fuck off, the hypocrisy of this yeah. town. And then we talked about Fred Willard. Now look, if you saw that third Pee Wee movie, you know, <laughs> I wish they didn't let him back in. He jerked off frankly. the Netflix executives on that one. Uh, anyway. Uh, and we talked about Fred Willard. And, and you. Uh, he recently got caught jerking off in, in Hollywood. Nobody cared. Granted, again? He didn't, he didn't have a kid's show. No, it was a couple years back. Oh, oh, that one. Yeah. But what did you say he said when they asked him? His tweet was, because everybody was pressing him for some kind of response. Yeah. And he goes, everybody's asking me to make a comment here. And folks, if you ask me, it was a lousy picture. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> funny man. And he kept working just fine. Because, yeah. I mean, what you know, what, what are they going to say? You're not allowed to do bit parts in Christopher Guest movies anymore? Right, exactly. Christopher Guest doesn't even make movies anymore. He's on our, our friend's show, Jake and Matt, corporate. He does a little part. Guest actually, is or Willard? He's Willard's going to be on an upcoming oh, nice. episode. But uh, Inger Bretson and my buddy Bridger Winnegar was a great follow on Twitter, by the way. But they did a uh, they both are they did a short film that I saw once at a comedy show. It was five minutes long, you know, some little thing they did for fun. And Fred Willard did that. Really? <laughs> like you could get he could probably do this podcast if we go. Wow. wow. He do, I think he just likes getting out of the house. All right. Um, anyway, about Paul Rubens. I love the man I always mm-hmm. have. And he's. Got a good little part in a new HBO miniseries that I just watched all of this weekend called Mosaic, which was directed by the great Steven Soderbergh, one of my favorite directors. Soderbergh does not take a break, dude. He doesn't. He's got that new iPhone movie coming out. Well, that's what I learned is that this whole thing, you're supposed to interact with an app while you watch the thing, but it's not like they never tell you like open the app at this part or something. It's like an interactive thing. I didn't. And they also said it works if you don't use the interactive experience. I did not. I, I don't have the patience for that kind of shit. But Mosaic was great. And Paul Rubens plays a really flamboyantly gay guy. Usually he kind of plays it coy what his sexuality is. Right. I guess he was gay and blow too. Uh, yes. But he's he's playing a similar role in Mosaic. Sharon Stone is awesome in it. And it's just like a five-part murder mystery uh, set in the snow. It was really good, really funny, and who steals the picture, Devin Ratray, uh, who portrayed Buzz, the older brother in Home Alone. Oh, okay. Who I, I raved about for his performance in Blue Ruin. 
on here, and the guy's become just a great fucking actor. He's so good in this. Oh, great. He's a big, fat loser, you know, and he's a cop. Oh, okay. And uh, he's, he's well, he's not a loser on the show. He, he's really good uh, in the part. I loved him. And I, I recommend it, although don't go in expecting closure. It's, it's one of those mysteries where you're kind of like, you be the judge. Right. Like, but I really liked it, and it was, as always with Soderbergh, very well shot. It felt very original to me. I liked it a lot. All right. I watched the entirety over the past month or so of the British multicam sitcom, The IT Crowd, which I had never really seen. I hear good things about The IT Crowd. I'm a big fan of... Uh, um, Graham Lineman. No. Linehan, sorry. The... Uh, Son of a bitch. The guy that uh, from Toast of London. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know his name, but he's very funny on the he's show. He's f- fucking hilarious. Yeah. So I need to watch IT Crowd. IT Crowd, you know, it is really funny. It's a great, like, classic old-fashioned sitcom. Uh, I think people, what always fascinates me is people that just shit on multicam sitcoms in general always love British sitcoms, and you're just being fooled by the accents. It's the same shows, right? The same premises, the same like forced situations, right? But British thing, the accents make people seem smarter than they are, and they make the show seem smarter than it is. It crowd is just a a big dumb funny show, and it's you know uh, the whole cast: Chris O'Dowd, and then Richard Ayadai, the guy from the your favorite, The Watch. Oh yeah, um, I like the watch. I day. It's just it's a very funny show. Yeah, he's kind of famous over there, right? He's yeah. He's I think famous. I feel like he was supposed to pop over here and it didn't happen. The watch was his big chance. Yeah, yeah. he directs and his movies are are kind of well received. Yeah, he did submarine and some other things, but he's kind of the Kramer of the show, you would say. Um, it's it's very funny, and the guy whoever we're talking about from Toast of London, I could look him up. I'm not going to, but he's great on it. There are some big big laughs on the show and the funniest if you want just uh to watch it's one an ex-girlfriend who loved the show showed to me and and uh it's it's the one to show somebody if you you want to try to get them hooked is season two episode one okay they go out to a night at the theater all right Uh, just a real like a like a seinfeldian kind of many many plots coming together in a beautiful way it's great it's great i recommend it and you i watched the entire run of the it crowd because british sitcoms are so short Mm -hmm. watch the whole thing in a day pretty much i saw one movie this week i saw the legend of boggy creek the hell's that well it's a classic horror film from the 70s it's a sort of mockumentary style thing it's sometimes described as the blair witch project of its day it's presented as it as being real okay uh but it's not real it's staged and it's just, it's like a Blair Witch Project except about Bigfoot in this place called Boggy Creek in uh, our Texarkana or something. So, uh, you know, it felt so much like an actual documentary that I wasn't that intrigued or scared. It, it felt way more like a, almost like a nature show than a horror movie. Okay. Uh it was it was just too it was like too lighthearted the music and everything, but it is pretty cool. It's way ahead of its time, uh, way ahead of its time, and uh, and it is a classic. So you know I don't know for research purposes maybe you check it out, but uh, all right I wouldn't run to to see it, uh, but it's classic horror, so it appear it, it fits right here, fits in right here. Did did was it convincing in any way or no? Yeah, there were shots that were convincing where you're like, oh, that looked like a Bigfoot. But then the problem is you saw if you saw at the time, it probably was super convincing. You see it now. You're like, obviously, it's not really Bigfoot. This movie would be legendarily known. Yeah, we would have seen Bigfoot at this point. <laughs> as the movie that proved Bigfoot existed. Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, I watched also stra- newly streaming on Netflix, a, f- a stupid and futile gesture. The story of the. Harvard Lampoon, National Lampoon. I sort of wanted to see it. I, I, I don't know. I'm not. It's that those things never really pull me in. Um, I had seen the documentary about uh, which was called uh, what the fuck was it? I think it was called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead, which is the line from Animal House, right? 
But um, I like the documentary. I'm as a comedy nerd going back to when I was a little kid. I I knew all this stuff. What was interesting about it was the way it was shot. There there was some really cool shot. David Wayne did it. Your old boss. Yep. Um, yeah, David's a very good director. Yeah, it was shot really well. And I, I just, it kept me at a distance because they made up so much stuff and there's so much fourth wall breaking. And yeah, that's kind of why I didn't want to see it. And like Martin Mole per being the guy, if yeah. he was still alive, but yeah. he's not still alive. And yeah. It, did it get dark at the end at least? Did it go into like how dark? A little dark? bit. I mean, Doug Kenny's a very dark guy who they're focusing on. Will Forte plays him. The cast is essentially everybody in, in comedy is in the movie in, in some capacity. Uh, our boy David Crumholtz, about a hundred pounds fatter, has a very small role. <laughs> where I, I mean, I couldn't believe how huge he was in the movie. But um, it, it's it's good. It's worth watching. It's it's good. I I I wouldn't. Um, you know, I I don't know what to say. It let me down a little bit. It coming so close to the heels of the documentary, I just sort of felt like. I, I guess I get why they went for this unorthodox approach, but I never like a movie where you have no idea at any point if what you're watching happened or not when it's supposed yeah. to be a, a biopic type thing. Yeah. But and they go on to the set of Caddyshack. So then there's certain points where it's like, uh, you know, John Daly is playing Bill Murray and yeah. John Gemberling is playing Belushi. And yeah, you're just looking at all these people and then they, they make a point of it. You know, Martin Mull's like, obviously, none of these people look exactly like the real people or whatever, but. So it's hard to wrap your mind around like Joel McHale being Chevy Chase and that kind of stuff. That was the one where I was like, this seems a little silly. Yeah, but, but but by and large, I was never bored. It's a very entertaining movie. And as a as a comedy guy, I, of course, had found a lot to like. See, I'd in rather it. I'd rather it have been a dark. Gritty, like sad thing. Yeah. I mean, the fucking Wikipedia. I read this thing on the guy's story. on Wikipedia. It's fucking horrifying. Yeah. It's so sad. And I'm like. I don't know. That's what a lot of the reviews were kind of. Well, the review. Some of the reviews were saying that they were like they were like, it's another story about how being funny isn't funny at all, and yeah, and uh, you know, blah 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 blah. But um, but I don't know. I, I'll watch it at some point. I'm just. It's just really not my thing. Yeah, and they did so. I know the spirit of the lampoon is very like anything goes and and no taboos and whatever. But like the way they handled. The fact that this, the entire staff of this thing for the entire run of it was all white and all that. Like, at one point, a, a black couple walks up to Martin Mull and they're like, So there were no black people in this? And he's like, Not a one, but it was a different time. You didn't have to hire black people back then. That right. kind of thing. And I was like, Boy, that's weird you know like that's a weird thing to put into this fucking movie well i gotta be honest that's the the main thing that made me not give a fuck about the movie yeah is that it's based on national lampoon harvard guys yeah yeah and it's like it's like look national lampoon gave me vacation thank yeah. you very much oh thank you very much and gave me caddyshack thank you very much yes National Lampoon has done little else that I've ever found funny. Right. The magazine is like guys with elbow pads right. on their jackets, you know, uh, snickering to one another. It's all very like white bread, highbrow bullshit. And, you know, yeah. it's like, look at us being naughty, the rich kids. Right. And, and then I saw the trailer and that, that repeat shot of Matt Walsh walking out of the office going, uh, uh, we pissed off the Jews. Yeah, we yeah. pissed off the Catholics. We pissed off the feminists. We pissed off... It's like... Yeah, it must be really tough to do whatever you want when you come from <laughs> money. But uh, So I don't know. Yeah. That puts a bad taste in my mouth. But that all being said, a lot of people I know were involved in it. A lot of people I like were involved in it. Uh, so I I'll probably watch it at some point. It's an entertaining flick. Can't deny it. Uh, and I love... I always love Will Forte. I'm sad anytime he's not playing MacGruber, but... I do love or, or, or the Falconer or I mean, that, that man had some funny fucking shit on, on SNL. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, you ever see his uh, spelling bee sketch? No, it was. I was in the audience. I went. It was a Jack Black, Neil Young show when I lived oh, in wow, New York. That's a good show. And since I knew people there, I, I went to it and it is so fucking funny. They, they get the word is like, <laughs> let's say the words like benign or something like that. And uh, he's like, he's like this super intense kid. But he, of course, he's a 40 year old Will Forza. And he just says letters for like five minutes, just various letters. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> and that shouldn't be funny, but he's a man who commits to a fucking bit 
and it's very funny. It's a it's a sketch to look up. Yeah, he's great. He's great. Um, shall we move into scary stuff? I have something for it this week. Go for it. I, I've been eyeing that over there. Uh, I went to uh, Frank and Sons Pop Culture Flea Market this week or where's that last week it's the one you vince and i've talked about it it's down in like we talked about all going together and then you didn't invite us is that what happened no this is what happened we all talked about going together and i said my friend john has been asking me to go there for years okay so i'd like to go so then i went with my friend john who's been asking me for years who quite frankly felt a little insulted when i said can i bring other people too (laughs) i understand that (laughs) so i went finally it's, it's all pop culture? It's all pop stuff. Yeah, okay. it's all, it's, it's, it's not a ton of movies, surprisingly, but memorabilia, toys, video games. How far games. is the drive from L.A.? It took me 40 minutes maybe to get there. Okay. Uh, video games, records, you know, all that kind of shit. It's great. Toys. Um, but I got a newly released, and I usually don't buy these types of things, but this box is so beautiful. And the figure was so well done that I bought it. Uh, NECA, N-E-C-A, and Real Toys, R-E-E-L Toys, put out a new uh, Nightmare on Elm Street uh, set of figures. One is from the first film and one is from the second film. The first film, I think that figure is already, I guess, out of print because it was far, far, far more expensive. But you can get the second movie film figure for 20 Four bucks, roughly, on Amazon, if you can't get to Frank and Sons. Uh, and it's actually cooler. I never thought I'd see the day where I said the Nightmare on Street 2 figure is cooler than the Nightmare on Street 1 figure, but it is. The box, beautiful artwork. One of the alternate poster images is on the front. On the back, you got this cool bus shot of Freddy on the school bus. You open it up on the inside. There is a very cool. Uh, I'm opening as if anybody can see this, but a very He's also really, really like modeling it and showing it off to just me. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Uh, inside, you got a very cool Freddy figure. Comes with three interchangeable heads. Of course, one of those heads is the uh, exposed brain head, so you can say, "I, you got the body, I got the brains." Uh, there are two interchangeable glove hands. One's the standard glove, and one is the when the knives are just coming straight out of the fingers. Uh, there are two of the demon dogs from the pool party scene and his hat, which is also removable. Uh, and then also flames that you can deta- attach or detach from his back. So you can reenact the whole, you're all my children now, which, you know, look, I get that the pool party scene is where the nightmare on Elm street series kind of jumped the shark there for a minute. Cause Freddie was in real life, but that scene is fucking awesome. So I don't care. Uh, anyway, Nika Toys, I believe it's pronounced, and Real Toys. What did set you back? Too. What? What did set you back? I got it for 20 bucks. Okay. Some people were selling it for 30 Some people were selling it for 25 I looked on Amazon. It was selling for twenty four ninety nine on Amazon. I said, all right, I'll go back to the guy selling it for 25 and put money in his pocket instead of ordering online. And then I, before, on my way to go back, I, there was in another shop that had them. And I was like, how much are these? And he's like, 20. I was yeah. like, well, you can't. Well, if it's not a lot of movie stuff, what is it? Music? Television? No, it's movie stuff. It's just not a lot of movies for sale necessarily. Oh, okay. But it's tons of movie stuff. It's tons of Star Wars figures and, uh-huh. and antique toys. And, and not antique, but like old toys from the 60s and like collectible figures and He-Man shit. And is that all you bought? Records. I got that. I got they have p- tons of people selling like old tops themed trading cards from yeah. every movie, whatever. So I got these horror themed trading cards from the late 80s. I bought Your a bunch goal of video is to games. make this apartment terrifying to a woman. The ladies love me. Girls adore me. <laughs> and I mean even the ones that never saw me. Uh, look. Did, you, did you tell people that I got you a, uh, a B. Arthur Dorothy Zbornak uh, figurine? From did the I Golden tell Girls? people at the Frankensons? You tell people on this podcast. No, I didn't. Mm, well, that's, I did. that's a little something for scary well, stuff. Well, you didn't. It's not scary stuff. It's not a scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think she's scary. She's certainly intimidating. I, I, it's it's amazing that at this point, after having participated properly several times, you still don't understand how this 
segment uh, well, works. Well, like, I mean, half the time you're talking about video games. The, Scary video games. Not always. No, it's always something with a fantastic element to okay. it or a monster right. element or something. Something that would be, if it was a movie, it would be a movie we could do on here. I'll be honest. I'm still a little hazy on the details of the segment. Uh, <laughs> Which is why I often don't 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 uh, participate in it. <laughs> Let's do a quick cranes crane shot. I almost called it cranes corner. Sure. Uh, I'm I'm still figuring out this segment. Now I will say, last time it was just kind of a lengthy recap of the episode. I, I don't know that people <laughs> need a synopsis of, of old Frasier episode. P.S. I love you. I was just going through the whole episode. That's true. What What, what do you think? But this that, should I be? think that was more fun because it was like we were incredulous at how stupid they were. I mean, this was just right. like, boy, this was a great episode. Of All Frasier. right, I, then I I I, I kind of could I, single out a favorite, but it would also help if you're going to do a segment if you knew what the episode season or name <laughs> or number one how about i just tell you for this week one of one, a great line that's that's what i should say i, should I would say, love it i should say this episode and then here's my favorite part in this episode great so here's an episode can't remember the name <laughs> season no, i'll I, get I ready know. next time though okay but this is a line i texted you uh, i believe fraser was speaking to a oh, yeah. garbage man who had garbage <laughs> stains on his shirt. Uh-huh. And uh, Fraser goes, Oh, please, let me recommend you to an excellent dry cleaner. I once spilled butter on a pair of white velvet pantaloons. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and then Roz goes, And he was wearing them at the time. <laughs> <laughs> white velvet pantaloons. It's a, I, it's I a love fantastic Kelsey. show. It's, an, it's amazing that it reached the huge audience it did. You know, like if you think about jo Joe Sixpack or whatever, uh, the the audiences that these shows kind of go for. I mean, I guess unless it's just making fun of these buffoons, I guess the dad is kind of the voice of the everyman telling them they're being very hit. much so. Yeah. And so is Roz and so is Daphne. Yeah. Uh, and eventually Daphne's Anthony LaPaglia comes in as right, Daphne's right, right. drunk brother. You know, I the original choice for uh, Tony Soprano, which would not have been as good a show by a million percent, even though I like him. That is interesting. Uh, I, and I do remember. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to mute the TV <laughs> and the That's all right. outro thing just went off. Son of a bitch. Let's give him some more promotion. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I can remember briefly an episode to recommend to people. Okay. They go. I don't remember the title again, but it's the Crane it, it's the Crane Boys Mysteries episode where they go back they go back to their old house that they were evicted from at one point and they talk about when they lived in that house they used to write their own mystery series uh -huh. called the Crane Boy Mysteries. Yeah. And uh that's like that's like the dream of like I've I've been in this position a few times uh where you 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 are so excited to get to work when you're in a writer's room because yeah. you know you've got something that's just going to light everybody up. Yeah. <laughs> like, imagine being like, oh, shit, like the Hardy Boys, but with Fraser and Niles. Yeah. And they, the, great the, idea. The gag is the the landlord still owns the place, and they, they decide they're going to buy it, then they decide not to buy it. They go, can we just pick up this one floorboard and look at our our time capsule that we put here. I remember the, that one. The guy says no. They sneak back into the house at night to dig it up. They find a skull in the floor that they set up at the top of the episode was their skull for when they put on a backyard production of Hamlet as children. Okay. They don't remember that. And then they the whole episode is them do, becoming the Crane Boys again. <laughs> <laughs> How do they set? How do they set it up? But don't remember it. You see a flashback. You to see, it? it opens with a flashback oh, of them okay. doing as children doing Hamlet. It's very and clever. And it's them just a this entire mystery, like how this guy's murdered his wife. Yeah, that's why they were evicted. Right. Uh, and there's a really funny line where uh, he goes, "The wife was <laughs> the wife uh, was worth millions." But she, it had to come through her, and she'd never let him live it down. And uh, and he goes, and that's why he killed her, Niles. And, uh, and Niles goes, but that wouldn't be insurance. That would be inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm excited to keep going. I, I stalled out at a certain point on Frasier, but I'll, I'll I got to get past the first season. It's a great. It's so good. All right, there you go. Was that brief enough for you? It was. I'm, it was. It was great. Good. I'm it was glad great. to hear it. As long as you're happy. <laughs> That's my uh, Tony uh, Soprano half-assed impression. 
It's always a heavy. Let's get into this movie, Pat. Our, this week's movie is Before I Wake. And folks, let me tell you, this thing should have been called <laughs> Please Just Let Me Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, to call a movie this slow paced before I wake <laughs> is just dangling chum over the shark's mouth. Um, I don't know what people think of this. I, I think it's been pretty well received. But so this is Mike Flanagan, who's, you know, hot shit. He's like, he's become the go to Stephen King guy. He did Gerald's game. This is the guy that did Gerald's game. Correct. It's the same director. Correct. Oh, God. And he did Oculus, which I did not see. Oculus is in my book, passable, but very forgettable. He is doing uh, the Shining sequel. Mike Flanagan, like he's be- right. he's become a, a big deal. People love him. I am finding now when I watch. Well, this- now I understand. By the way, why as I was almost spitting at the screen at how much I hated this movie. Yeah, the AV Club for some reason gave it a nice glowing review. Well, of course, now it makes sense. All right, you know what I'm confused by? Does the AV Club like the show The Good Place? They it's, probably. It, do. It's not clear. They probably do because so they write 18 articles about it every day. Well, I, I, was, I was trying to do a bit. You didn't. Oh, you didn't yes I didn't know that. Do, wait, oh, do they? Oh, wait, they really like it. Every fu- every every episode, it's like the good place bl- blows fucking minds. Like they'll they'll say fuck in the title. Like it's the most earth shattering reveal in the history of television on tonight's good. That play. fucking publication has become so transparent. It's 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 sad. It saddens me. I, I've always enjoyed the AV Club. It's the only place, really, to get kind of a a, a, I, a sensical view of things. Their TV I, reviews do drive me crazy. I disagree. I've always thought they always played up the underdog when it was cool to do that, and now yeah. that it's and now that all the underdogs are making mainstream crap, they just praise that. Well, I mean, I, they do have a, a segment called Podmass where they've never, of course, mentioned this podcast no, once. But they've I, never you, reviewed you, one of my albums. I don't give a fuck. You'd hate to alienate them, but they uh, they have their favorites, and that's all they write about. That, but that's what I'm saying. A guy I, I've become a, online acquaintances with, Nathan Rabin, uh, is a we well, used to be my favorite writer on the AV Club because they used to have a lot of great personalities, and you'd read all their stuff. Oh, that's cool. They edged all these people out. Um, but yeah, because they were like, I'm not giving a good review to the fucking good place. Right. Well, he was, respect disrespect to Ted Danson, by the way. He I haven't seen the good place. I, I'm just saying they they could back off its nuts a little. Uh, but Nathan Rabin used to, he essentially was the AV club. He did uh, my year of flops, which is where he'd, he'd re- review a notorious flop. And they were like, I have a book, a collection of my year of flops. So it's the only time the one, one a few times the AV Club had book release. That's how popular his columns were. Sure, you know he'd write about Freddie got fingered, and then he would say it was this a uh, was this worthy of flopping? Was it as bad as they say? Right. He had all these great columns, and he said at one point he wrote them, and he was like, "Look, I had to move back in with my parents. I'm married. I have a newborn baby. My columns." generate a great deal of traffic for this site and he included the email he posted this to facebook the other day and it was like can i please have a raise of 50 dollars?" right and not only did they not respond to it they pulled his column and he was essentially fired from the av club for asking what are you dancing around saying nice sh- 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 I guess these, I guess because thing. they're a site that you need to like your shit going forward, and oh, I'm a creator in this business. Wait till anybody. Occasionally, I try. I have to play the game a little bit. I play the game I, I a little they bit. Like the, they're going to give my show an F regardless, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> if they even review it, which they probably won't. Um, he did Hush, which was, went to Netflix. I thought Hush was very cool. I never ended up watching where it. she's deaf and the guy's outside. Yeah. Very cool. He did Ouija Origin of Evil, Ouija Board 2. I love that movie. I thought it was fine. I, I liked it less than you, but it was well done. He did Gerald's Game. And I he's love got Game. six upcoming projects, including a new, apparently, reboot of I Know What You Did Last Summer. Um, but what I'm finding, and maybe it's the Netflix, you know, the Netflix machine or something, but the movies all look kind of the same and they all feel kind of the same. So yeah. He's got kind of a style, I guess, but I guess that style would be like kind of depressing horror in a weird way. And I was texting you last night. This movie, it tips the scales too far. It's 
so depressing that there's none of the joy or the fun of horror and the uh, yeah. scares don't hit because you're still thinking about how this kid's mom died of cancer. It's it's very depressing. I don't like uh I mean this this was an uphill fight for me from the jump because I didn't like uh, as soon as it starts it's playing the somber piano music. I'm yeah. like, "Oh, for Christ's sakes." Like it's so paint by numbers. Every literally every scare in the film is a jump scare. Yeah. And guys, here's the thing. Jump scares aren't scares startling somebody isn't scaring them right all right that's surprise okay there's a difference you have to create atmosphere the exorcist is scary when he walks into the room nothing is going right there's no stupid fucking 808 bass sound effect it's but much anyway. it's much harder to to not use these jump scares uh, on the fifth time kate bosworth walks into that bathroom towards the tub and it's silent for a full minute, and you're just like, "When is the kid gonna pop out of the tub?" And, and you yes. know, I, I'm I'm watching it at midnight, so I'm turning the TV down, and then I, you can't hear the dialogue, no. so you turn it up, and then and somebody jumps out of the fucking tub. I'm like, not only is this not scary, it's annoying. Yeah, and I, you know, like I was in the same position, and it's like. The whole th- I can't hear the fucking movie, yeah. so I'm turning it up, and then every time one of these stupid jolts happens, my subwoofer sounds like it's going to go through the wall yeah, into exactly. my neighbor's apartment, and I feel like an asshole, right. so I'm trying to turn that down. It's like, just fucking... Anyway, and it's the, <laughs> literally the same sound effect at every scare. Same sound effect at every scare. And not, not just in this, in this movie, in every fucking horror movie anymore. Yeah. And... And I, it makes sense now with Origin of Evil because when he, when the kid goes like creepy, when the imaginary kid goes creepy, or whatever. Yeah, I was like, that just looks like the Origin of Evil thing that happened yeah. with the girl. Like that that's been done already. Like that's not interesting to me. Uh, but well, I think I, I mean he thought director. this movie was never going to get released because the company that financed it went under. So he might have just been like, I'll just use some of the stuff from Ouija Board Two in this movie. But I, let's we got to talk about Thomas Jane's hair. Oh, by the way, the plot of the movie, we never even said. Sure. Uh, a, a family who's lost a son. That final reveal, man. Oh, God. Yeah. The uh, the family who's lost a, a fa- p- couple who's lost a son adopt a new kid or a foster kid who's been from house to house. He's a great kid. They don't understand why he's getting bounced around. They find out uh, rather quickly that the kid has this unique ability that whenever he dreams when he's asleep, the thing actually appears in real life. Uh, And whenever he has a nightmare, that thing also appears, which you know you're in trouble because the trailer literally has the line, whatever he dreams happens for real. Yeah. Unfortunately, (laughs) so do his nightmares. Uh So right there, you're like, Uh all right. So that's the plot. Not not a premise that couldn't have been made an effective movie. It could have been, but once you have, it's 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 diet nightmare on Elm Street. That's all it is. It's like, it's it's a much younger kid. It's a much less scary monster. The kid doesn't want to sleep. I mean, this is a fucking absurd thing in the Kate Bosworth. This kid's like five. Kate Bosworth finds like the, he's got like stay awake pills in his uh-huh. bag, which how the fuck did he even get them? First of all, <laughs> but he's got them. And she goes, uh, well, the opening scene is is the is a guy creeping in to shoot the kid, <laughs> which I guess is a, a way to open a movie. I was like, OK, Um that that kid was in Room, Jacob Tremblay. I right. loved Room, and I loved him in Room. I'm not. I'm not. I'm never gonna pick on a kid actor, but no. I mean, he was in the kid in Wonder as well with the face. I mean, oh, that's the same kid. Yeah, he's just that. there's something about him, and I, I I guess I am gonna pick on him. I I just don't like now. I, I he's he's got this way of acting where I'm like he, he annoyed me. I don't know what to say. Well, he's very much a modern. He's very much a modern day kid. Yeah. Like he's very There's no personality. There's no personality, yet there's a ton of emotion and I'm just right. everything is like, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to be special. Yeah. You know, it gets annoying. But I mean, she finds these pills that he's got, and then she goes this is the line that Kate, forty year old Kate Bosworth says to the five year old, 
I found some of your stimulants. Yeah. This is what she says to the kid. <laughs> and he knows what she's talking about somehow. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Jane plays the husband, who I loved in 1820, whatever that 1922. Movie was 1922. Yeah. Another Stephen King adaptation that I thought was great. Yeah. Thomas Jane, I think, is great. He's in The Mist, which we've said many times is, is a contender for best adaptation of a Stephen Fantastic. King film. He's in Boogie Nights, folks. He's in Boogie Nights. The fence rests. His hair in this fucking thing is outrageous. Ridiculous. I feel like I, I don't know what could have caused it, really. I, I don't know what who decided on it. Uh, they, they got him dolled up like <laughs> t like a. Uh, like Thomas Hayden Church yeah. in Sideways. Yeah. Like, but with greasier hair even. Like, it's like, what are you doing? It's yeah. not a period piece. Right. It takes place right now. Yeah. It looks absurd. He Well, he's he makes no impact at all in the movie. Uh, and Bosworth, I mean, Kate Bosworth's a, a, a pretty lady, but did anyone see this coming that she would have some 20-year career? It's like, what what is she bringing to the fucking table? Very little. Very little. Um, These are very wooden performances through the entire thing, particularly from uh, uh, the uh, the lady that plays the, the you know, the foster care lady. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Annabeth Gish. Yeah. Like from an excellent show that used to be on Showtime called Brotherhood, if you want to look that up, and she was awesome on it. She's a good actor, yeah, but she really, do. it's this really, like, I mean, I, the the script sucks. It's the same with, it's the same with all of them. It's a very it, it's they're just very wooden performances because the the emotional depth is not written into the text. It's not in the language or the dialogue. It's just not there for people dealing with things that are this weighty. You can only take so many support group scenes yeah. before you say, all right, I get it. They're hurting, but show me in some other way. I don't need to see them sitting in a circle five different times to understand that they're in pain. Sh do, write a, a good fucking scene about it. Right. <clears throat> that never seems to come. Uh, Bosworth's character starts manipulating the kid and making him sleep so so he can make their little boy appear to them. That's basically the premise. And then an evil thing appears. The evil thing turns out to just be the little boy because of his because it's a vision of what his mom looked like when she died of cancer, uh, which which I found a little weird. I tell you, man, when they. When they cut to her and it was like, oh, canker. You think can cancer is pronounced canker. He keeps calling him the canker man. I mean, like, and, you know, maybe it's just having been touched by cancer in my life, as, as I'm sure most people have at this point. It just felt weird. That, that's, I guess, the best way to put it. Like, it felt weird to me, too. And, and I... It felt I weird just to me, too. Hated it. And that's the final reveal of the thing. And I was just like, fuck you. After all this misery... You're going to double down on the misery with this, like, ending that just makes you wish you were dead, kind of. Well, then also, too, I thought it was a little a bit of an odd choice to say this little boy thought his mom looked scary when she was dying. Yeah. From this horrible disease that yeah. takes so many people you love in your life away from you. So that's what the monster is based on. I th It was just li and look. Above all else, I'm I'm always one to defend within the within the confines of art. It's art. I'm never going to say something shouldn't be a certain way. Do whatever the hell you want in the name of entertainment. I don't care. I think everything is okay. So I will tell you the thing that offended me more than that was the schmaltz factor of the whole thing. And yeah. I mean, this movie was, I mean, on Robin Williams' worst day, he didn't hit this level of schmaltz. And I mean, and that guy was, you know. This was bicentennial man level schmaltz. Right. Uh, it ends with the kid like Kate Bosworth and the kid. By the way, the, the the cancer monster that he dreams of that is actually just him somehow can kill people. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. Yet his dreams when he wakes up, the things go away. Yet the people are still dead. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Where do the people and then go? At the end, no, I guess he can control them when he summons the butterfly. Is that? What we're supposed I, to take away know. from that? I the don't butterfly know. thing was weird. And when she presents that butterfly pillow, I was like, what? And how did she know that that's what this was? Like, it, it, it didn't make any sense. Yeah. Why also? She hugs the monster at one at one point. Yeah, and it, and it turns into him. Yeah. And also then, why at the end was Gish 
in like a cocoon and not just eaten by the monster like everybody else like there was why did that happen that was it was pointless it was just a way to keep her alive that's literally all that was and yeah. it made no sense uh and then also um the the final scene of this fucking thing is the is Bosworth on the bed with the kid just the schmaltziest, shittiest dialogue I've ever heard. And then it ends. Th- this is the last line of the movie because he doesn't say this to her until the, this this line. It's him looking up and going, I love you. Uh-huh. Beat, beat, yeah. beat. Mom. Right. Swelling orchestral music as he looks at his hand and a butterfly. <laughs> appe- I was like, go. F-. I literally yelled, go <laughs> fuck yourself at the television. It, it, what a piece of shit this fucking movie was. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Flanagan's going to be around a long time. He's made some good movies. I think he's a talented guy. Uh, this this one really felt like a misstep to me. And I just I just walked away from it so sad, you know, like just like empty. And I wish I, I wished I hadn't watched it, I guess is what I would say. You know, like it was uh, I always like a bit of fun with my horror. But if I'm not going to get that. I'd like it to be, you know, something other than this. I, I You can't have like a serious, somber drama about grieving parents mixed with horror elements. And, and uh, you can. I mean, people like this movie. But it's uh, for me, I'm just kind of like, you got to pick a lane here. It, it, it felt exploitative of cancer in a weird way. And I didn't like it. I didn't like it anything about it. It was sappy bullshit. Yeah. It was sa- I wasn't sad after. I was angry that it yeah. was a fucking sap fest. And it would have been, you know what, way cooler instead of, uh, you know, everybody patting themselves on the back with what they think is this beautiful story of of loss and gain that they've told. It would have been so much cooler. I'm sitting there going, you know what, hey, fuck it. If this twists and I find out Thomas Jane, like, killed the son uh-huh. and he's evil and then that monster is going to kill him and whatever, like, I was like, oh, that will be cool. Right. And it never happens, and it just plays out like this boring ass fucking uh, shitty, fuck, uh, sp- like Spielberg at his worst kind of fucking. Ter- Ugh, it sucked. It's a lot of Kate Bosworth walking slowly and sadly down hallways, and then something jumps out at her. It happens twenty five times. That it does. Um, anyway, that's our show, folks. Two hogs down. For uh, before I wake, uh, <laughs> two <hawks> down. <laughs> yep, uh, we will be back. Uh, I believe, although as you know, these are never hard and fast rules. But I believe our next picture will be Blade, which was a request from the Facebook page. I wrote Joe. I haven't seen this thing in forever. I'd love to watch it. So uh, refresh yourself on Blade, and that's also going to. Uh, you know, coincide with the re- upcoming release of Black Panther, because this will be kind of the first uh, black Marvel superhero blade. Maybe not the first. I don't know. But right. Um, and maybe and I'm sure the blade talk will bleed into two and three a bit. Yes. I would, I and would we are also 100 uh, percent. I don't know. I think it comes out Friday or maybe next Friday. Um, going to be doing Black Panther. I guarantee that. So uh, let's not 100 percent that one. I'm superheroed out at this point. I can't. But everyone's raving about it. I don't give a fuck. Everybody raved about Wonder Woman. You didn't want to see it. I'm the one who vowed never to see it. I saw Wonder Woman, and guess what? Bored again, folks. I can't Bored do these again. superhero movies. I can't do All it right. anymore. So let's... We we might... I'll tell you one... Th- here, here's a definite one we're going to do. Nicolas Cage's Mom and Dad will we're definitely do Mom be and Dad. Yes, on this that's show. true. Uh, so those are just some of the, of the upcoming month. Um, I am online at the Patrick Walsh on Twitter and Instagram. My show starring Joe DeRosa, the pilot, Living Biblically, premieres February 26, 930, 830 Central on CBS. And that is coming right up, folks. As I said last week, I do not approve or endorse the promos for the show. Just listen to me. Look me in the eyes. The show is funny and good, and I hope you watch it. Joe DeRosa Comedy on Twitter and uh, um, uh, Instagram. And we'll see you next time, and we'll see you in hell. That was a HeadGum Podcast.